Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're continuing our Lenten journey uh, by going through the book of Luke. Uh, because it, it really is, a, it's the gospel that encapsulates how Jesus views the people that we tend to cast aside in society. Or we, or we push down, or we don't look at them as being on the level with everyone else in our world. And so we're going to take a look today, uh, we're going to continue that rather, uh, and one of our guides for this is a book written by Reverend Adam Hamilton at United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. Uh, what I'm basically doing is taking Adam's book and using some of his stuff that he's provided as a possible outline. I'm injecting some of my own stuff in there. and uh, Hopefully we're, we're, we're enjoying this and we'll, we'll have a good time through the rest of Lent as we do this together. Uh, and one of, the, one of the groups that are identified in Luke as those groups that have been held down, and we still have it today, right, is women. And so today we're going to talk about what Jesus had to say about women, both in his words and his actions. But I want to start off with this. I want you to think for just a moment. One family member, one non-family member. So two people, women in the course of your lives that have made a difference in your life. Think of the relative and the non-relative. So the relative, at least for me, is pretty easy, but it's kind of, at the same time, it's kind of difficult because there's so many. You know, so I had my mom, I had my grandmother. She's the first one that read the Bible to me. I have an aunt that to this day is still like a second mom to me. Um, those are relatives, but I've had a lot of others, you know, and maybe you have too. It could be that non-relative person. It could be a next door neighbor. Uh, it could be a coach, um, a boss. Um, if I were to answer the question about the non-family member that, that really had an impact on me, it would be a woman named Roxy Whitaker. Roxy was, I bet she wasn't more than five feet two inches tall. Uh, she drove a really cool yellow Camaro, though, when I was a kid. And I lived right across from the elementary school. She was a teacher, and I could see her pull up every day. From the time I was in kindergarten, I loved that car. And then when I got to sixth grade, Roxy was my teacher. She was the first black teacher that I'd ever had. And all that's just to say that this was Leavenworth, Kansas in the 1970s. Uh, so there weren't a lot of black teachers to start with, but I had Roxy Whitaker. And the reason Roxy was so important to me, and the reason I kind of kept in contact with her for a little while anyway, I lost contact a long time ago, but she was the one that taught me to study. She's the person that looked me straight in the eye and said, you're better than this. You can do better. You can work harder, and I'm going to make sure you work harder. She's the first of two teachers in my entire life that gave me a C. I got a C plus in, span, in, in uh, science in sixth grade, one quarter. She didn't like the project that I did about Mexico City. I still remember that to this day. It still sticks in my craw. But that, after that assignment, I went up to her and asked what was going on with this. And she, that's when she told me, you're capable of much better. And to be honest with you, until that time, I had coasted. I didn't have to work very hard. But Mrs. Whitaker taught me to study. Now, our country has come a long way when it comes to gender equity, but we still have a long, long way to go. Uh, I think the women in the room might, might be nodding their heads here, but think about these things. So uh, since the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, that's when women finally had the right to vote in the United States. So we're only 103 years into this thing of women even having a voice at the ballot box. That's kind of amazing to me. To this day, women make on average 80 to 84 cents on the dollar that a man in the same position, same skill set earns on average. When we look at the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, even though women make up a little over 50% of the U.S. population, fewer than 30% of the positions in those two elected offices are women. In our own denomination, the United Methodist Church, only 5% of women, or I'm sorry, of the largest churches, so the large churches in our denomination, are only led by women 5% of the time. That's kind of an astonishing statistic for a denomination that builds itself on social justice. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. And of course, we all understand the idea of women face much more uh, 
uh, violence and sexual harassment. In fact, one in six women in the United States will be assaulted in some way, shape, or form during their lives. That's a stunning statistic. Now, to understand uh, why I'm getting into all this, I want you to Luke is, is, is a book that helps us to see how Jesus viewed women 2,000 years ago. And the reality is Jesus, as we're going to learn, didn't look at women as being subservient, didn't look at women as being less than. In fact, Jesus elevates women, especially through his actions. And I think actions speak a lot more than words, and we're going to see that today. But to get an idea of just how important and how revolutionary Jesus was when it came to women, we have to understand what that society was like that Jesus lived in. First century Palestine was no different than anywhere else in the world, really, at that point. Um, and so, some things about women in that era. Uh, women couldn't testify in the court system that they had, because women were deemed to be not intelligent enough to get facts straight, to share in, a, in such an important venue. Women were not permitted to be rabbis, they weren't permitted to be priests, they weren't permitted to have any kind of power in the temple structure of the day. And just to show just how little women held influence in that era, look at your Bible. If you were to count how many people were named in Scripture, you get about 1,700 names throughout the entire books, all the books of our Bible. Only 137 of those are women's names. So to say that it was a, a, a male-dominated, misogynistic uh, society, as bad as ours is today, it was actually way worse back when Luke was written. But there's good news about Luke. Luke mentions women way more than any of the other Gospels. Uh, and Luke often tells the story of a man, and then he tells a parallel story involving a woman in some way. So if you want to get a good experience of biblical girl power, read the book of Luke, because uh, you're going to get an idea about what this author at least had to say about it. And the other thing that's really cool is that Luke actually gives credit to women for what they do. They're not just named because they gave birth to somebody. They get actually some recognition. So one of the things that Gail read earlier was Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And it names, first of all, well, that's a unique thing. They actually name the women. And some of the women that we hear, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and quote, many others. And Luke says what they did. It says that they, quote, provided for them out of their resources. In other words, these women bankrolled Jesus' ministry. They provided the resources necessary to move people from one area, one town to the next, to pay for the food, to help them get whatever they needed resources-wise. These women helped pay for that. That's pretty impressive. What would Jesus' ministry have been like if those women didn't play a part? How would it have been different? I don't know the answer to that. Now think about the women I asked you to put in your mind, that relative and that non-relative. What would your life be like if either one of those people had not been part of your life? How would your life have been different? What would have been missing from your lives? One of the stories that we hear in Luke is a great compare and contrast narrative and it's a sibling rivalry kind of, kind of story. Mary and Martha. Some of you know this story well, and some of you maybe not, but we're going to go through it today. It's a story about two sisters. It's a story about gender roles in first century. And it's a story that has a, a little bit of a twist at the end because of how Jesus reacts. We're going to read this. This morning, it's Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. While Jesus and his disciples were traveling, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his message. By contrast, Martha was preoccupied with getting everything ready for their meal. So Martha came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left, has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. 
The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. We have two sisters, and they are planning a party. They're inviting people in. Remember, Jesus and his disciples were nomads, basically. They moved from town to town to town, preaching in the countryside. They come to a town, and they were very dependent on the resources in that town. And, as we read, the resources financially of those women that happened to be tagging along. I would argue they weren't just tagging along, though. I think they were disciples of Jesus Christ, just like Peter, James, John, Andrew, all the others. They just didn't get named because they were women. And the authors of these books were just as much a part of that male-dominated society as everybody else. Martha is busy with all the hospitality stuff. She is cooking. She is cleaning. She's trying to be a perfect host because she wants us to be perfect for Jesus and the other people that come with him, but specifically for Jesus. And so she's trying her best to make everyone welcome. Mary, her sister, not so much. She's sitting with Jesus in the living room, we might say, Sitting there, think about your own living room here. Uh, in my living room, I have this vision of Mary sitting on the ottoman next to the recliner where Jesus is sitting, talking to everybody else that's in the room. Get that vision in your head for just a moment because I think it plays a role here. Uh, Martha is, is absolutely fulfilling every expectation of her from the society of that day. And you all understand it because anybody here, and you're lying if you don't nod your head to this, I'm telling you right now, somebody comes to your house, what do we do? We declutter the heck out of it, don't we? We pick everything up, we put stuff away. It may even mean throwing a few things in the closet or into a drawer that you've got to remember to get out later and then put it back wherever it was because otherwise you'll forget all about it. In other words, we try to make our homes look as unlived in as possible for when somebody comes to visit us, don't we? That is what Martha was doing. She was cleaning and she was cooking. Not just for Jesus. Remember, he had a band of people with him. So she's cooking for 15 or 16 people, at least, maybe more. She's doing what is expected of her in that society. That was the woman's role. Have we changed much in 2,000 years? Probably not as much as we should. What's Mary doing? Mary is invading the men's space. She's not just invading it. She is all over in it. The tradition in that era was when the teacher came, or the rabbi came, that person would come in and they, they would, first of all, they wandered the countryside. Jesus was not, you need to understand this, Jesus was not unique in the fact that he was traveling the countryside with a band of followers. Whenever there was a rabbi or a teacher that had something new and innovative to teach, People would flock to them, and they would follow them from town to town to town. The only thing that made Jesus really uh, interesting and, and uh, unique in that era was, number one, he's the Son of God. That's going to always win you points. Uh, but number two, he's, he's teaching a message that really resonated with the people who were just the average Joe and Jane Q public. He wasn't talking to the elite he wasn't talking to the ruling people. He wasn't talking to the religious leaders. He was talking to people like you and me. That was different. So in the first century, when the rabbi would come to town, he got, he got invited to dinner. It was always a he, remember? He'd sit down, and the men would gather around to hear what this teacher had to say. Now, the women could hear too, but it was only what they could overhear from the kitchen area. It wasn't like a kitchen we had today. I mean, it's not like there were walls or anything. This was just one open room. So the women could hear, but they weren't allowed to be right at the foot or right next to the rabbi. That was, that was reserved for the men. Mary's like, no, this is too important. Mary goes and sits down at Jesus' feet. She's going to get every little bit that Jesus can teach her. She's going totally against the grain. And Martha does what I would probably do if I was cooking and cleaning. What are you doing? Get in here and help me. Do you not see all these people? 
she expects Jesus to help her out. She goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'm trying to cook for all your people that you brought here, and we really love having you, but can you tell my sister to get off her lazy rear end and get in here and help me out? Jesus instead looks at Martha and says, Martha, stop worrying about being distracted. Stop worrying about all the details of this meal because that's actually just a small part of what we're doing here today. The most important part is what Mary is learning. You need to do that too. In fact, what's going on is Jesus is telling Martha that he expects her to pause and to stop her work and to reflect on what's being taught. A time of introspection. I think there are two ways to read into what Jesus is saying. The first thing is, Jesus wants Martha to strive to be more, just like my teacher wanted with me. Learn more, be more than what you are right now, Martha. Second thing, I think Jesus is saying that while it's important to do work, and trust me, folks, it is important to do the work, but it's important to know there's a time for the work, and there's a time for the quiet, the reflection, the learning. And the reality is our world needs both people. We need Mary's and we need Martha's. We need the people who will sit there and learn and pass it on. And we need the people who will be the worker bees, the ones who will do what needs to be done. And the real reality is each of us need to have those two roles at some point. At some point in our lives, in some point in our years, sometimes some points of our day. We need to have that time where we're reflecting and learning and the time when we are active and doing. Jesus wants Martha to do what Mary's doing right there, to learn, expand her mind, replenish her soul. And the reality in this world is we need both. We need both Mary's. We need both, we need both Mary's and Martha's. That last passage that, that uh, Gail read to us today is, is Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 39. And it is a story about judgment. And that's something that women in the world today face vastly more of than men ever do. Think about what women get judged on on a pretty much a daily basis just by walking outside of your front doors. Your hair, your makeup, what you wear, what you weigh. All those kinds of things that people make judgments. And i got to tell you, folks, it's not just men making judgments. I hear enough women making judgments about other women, too. That happens. Um, but I'm going to take it from the men's perspective here. I mean, it's mostly our fault, right? <laughs> That's just the way it works. But, but this person walks in. Jesus is, is, is dining. He's having a meal with the Pharisee. Now, I don't know if you understand what the Pharisee and the Sadducees are, so we're going to just do a very, very quick lesson here. There are two types of priests, priestly types of folks anyway. The Sadducees were the ones that they were, they had to end with the ruling class. They were the ones that if people had power and authority, the Sadducees were the ones that, that they dealt with. They were the ones that were kind of in charge. The Pharisees were the priests of the people. The Pharisees were the ones that hung out with the people that just lived in the villages, the common folk like you and me. So the reason you see Jesus interact with the Pharisees a lot more often is because Jesus is with the common folk. The Pharisees are with the common folk. That's why they intersect so often. The Sadducees, Jesus, you know, he's dealing with the people. We don't care about them. We care about the people who are in charge. So that's the Pharisees. And so Jesus is having dinner with Pharisee. And while he's having dinner, this woman walks in. And it's really important to understand how weird that would be. <laughs> now today, we would, if somebody just walks in your front door, you've got a problem with that. I know I do. In this day and age, it was not totally uncommon for people to you know, kind of peer inside, because it's not like they had locks on the doors all that often. Uh, it's not like they had glass windows very often. So people could kind of see in, see what was going on. Um, that's what's happening here. This woman sees Jesus and decides to come in. And what does the Pharisee do? The Pharisee makes a spot judgment. 
Now, we don't know what Simon, that's the Pharisee's name, we don't know necessarily what he thinks this woman's issue is. Some, so, some people suppose, biblical scholars, people a lot smarter than me, think, oh, maybe she was a known prostitute. Or she may have had some other type of, of a sin that she was guilty of. All we know is that she came looking for Jesus. I can tell you the one thing we absolutely know about this woman. She believed. She knew that Jesus was her one way for redemption. And so she was going to take that opportunity. She didn't let the role, the, I mean the roles would have dictated that she not come in. The rules would have dictated that she would just kind of keep a, a distance from Jesus because he was the rabbi. She knew she needed that man. She needed Jesus to be redeemed. And so that's what she did. But Simon makes a judgment about her. And in doing so, he also makes a judgment about Jesus. Well, this man that I invited over, I thought he was so special, but holy cow, he can't really be a prophet because a prophet would know better than to associate with a person like this, to let that per kind of person get that close. And a woman to boot? I made a big mistake with my dinner invitation. That's what the Pharisee is thinking. What the Pharisee sees is a sinner. The Pharisee sees a person that is not on his level. Jesus sees a woman. Jesus sees a person of value. Jesus sees someone that is a creation of the living, loving God. And I have to sit here today, stand here today rather, and, and confess to you that once upon a time, and probably more often than I'd like to admit, I have been Simon the Pharisee. Too often I have seen somebody at a distance or had a brief conversation with them, and I made a judgment about their entire being. Maybe some of you have had that, made that mistake too. It's not anything I'm proud of, but it's something that I have to own. Because Jesus' reaction to this woman is so very different than what mine would have been. I probably identify more with Simon the Pharisee than I want to admit. But Jesus, if we were to continue reading, is going to tell a parable to the Pharisee to help him understand that this person you may not think is up to your standards, but God forgives all of that. God values her. She's important. She's a child of God. And the good news that we have out of all this, these stories today is that you need to know that too. God values you. Doesn't matter if you're a man, especially if you're a woman, you need to understand God values you. And that's where we're going to end today. So if you feel like you've been kind of cast aside, and women have every reason to think that, the way that politics have gone in recent years, um, some of the advances we've made have kind of been tampered down, um, you need to know that Jesus values you. Jesus sees you as equal. You are valued. Let's pray. Loving God, we sometimes get it all confused when we should be in action for you and when we should be still and to listen. We ask that you grant us wisdom to understand when each of those skills is needed to further your kingdom here on earth. Help each of us in our own way to be advocates for women. Help us to avoid judgment of others and help us to see all people through your eyes as people to be treasured we thank you, Lord, that all of us are valued. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.